Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome. My name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet, I focus on unsolved true crime, but also I talk a lot about history, those moments in history that you probably weren't taught about in school. Today we're gonna to be talking about a disaster that happened here in England 33 years ago, but one which seems to have fallen under the radar. 51 people died on the night in question, the deaths were named as unlawful killings, and yet to this day, there's been no justice, no fines, no prison sentences, nothing, no answers. Just an acknowledgement that yeah, it was unlawful, but that doesn't mean much really for the survivors and families, does it? This is the Marchioness disaster, a collision between two vessels on the River Thames right in the middle of London. The smaller of the two vessels, party boat Marchioness, stood no chance as the dredger Bow Bell steamed right over the top of it. Within just 30 seconds of impact, the Marchioness was sat on the bottom of the Thames, 51 people dead who just moments before were celebrating the birthday of their friend, Antonio de Vasconcelos. Antonio and his friend and business partner, Jonathan Pang, had decided to organise something very fun for Antonio's 26th birthday. They sort of looked around a little bit at different things they could do, but they knew they wanted something different. And that's when they came across the idea of a party boat travelling down the Thames. Now, Jonathan said that it was actually more Antonio who was keen on the boat idea. He said that when they originally went to look at the Marchioness, it smelt and looked like a floating pub. It really wasn't very impressive. And then there's also the whole thing that if you're on a party on a boat and then you decide you've had enough, well, tough, you're kind of stuck. But Antonio was keen and it was his birthday, so they booked it for a party on the night of the 19th to 20th of August 1989. Jonathan paid £695 to book it from 1am to 6am and then paid extra for the disco, food and drinks. The night started for them with a dinner party and then they met up with some more friends and all headed towards the Thames to board the boat. Now Jonathan and Antonio were pretty popular people, they were business partners in a photographic agency, they knew a lot of different people, some students, people in fashion, journalism, modelling, these were young people in a very fun industry in London just wanting to let loose and have some fun. When people heard about a boat party with it being something different they were all really excited a lot of people were coming. And so that night, loads of people piled on board. But no one was really counting how many people were getting on this tiny boat. No one was keeping track of names. We know now there were 130 people aboard this boat, but in the days following the disaster with no list of names, authorities had no idea how long to keep looking for bodies in the water. They didn't know if it was 130 or 150. And 130 people aboard this pretty tiny boat was quite a squeeze, or do we call it a ship, a vessel? What do you refer to a boat of this size as? I'm not entirely sure, I'm gonna keep calling it a boat or maybe a ship. The Marchioness had a long and interesting history. She'd been built in 1923 for a businessman who wanted to run pleasure launches on the Thames. So she spent most of her life on this same river. But during the Second World War, she was actually requisitioned by the Thames Hospital Emergency Service. Like everything in London and the country at this point went towards the war effort, including boats. In fact, in 1940, the Marchioness was even one of the small boats that headed over to Dunkirk to help with the evacuation from the beaches. From there, she exchanged hands a few times until in 1978, she was purchased by Tidal Cruises and was then rebuilt to include a lower and upper saloon, more space for 159 passengers and two crew members that she was licensed to hold. The boat was 85.5 feet long and 14.5 feet wide. That's 26 metres by 4.5 metres to those who moan whenever I use imperial measures. That's not all that big, especially to hold so many party goers. It's been hard to figure out the exact layout of the boat. There isn't really any sort of like floor plans I could find online, but basically she had two levels. You had to walk down some stairs to get to the lower saloon, which was quite small and quite claustrophobic. It would get very hot. And the upper saloon seemed to have been slightly more spacious from survivor accounts. Next to this upper saloon was the wheelhouse, which did actually have its vision obstructed because of the upper saloon. The wheelhouse would have been where the captain and mate were driving the boat, sailing the boat. I really should have looked up proper sort of boating terminology before making this video, but it didn't occur to me until I'm saying this all out loud. 
All in all, the Marchioness was a health and safety nightmare from the very start. It was claustrophobic with some sliding perspex windows that were supposed to be used as an emergency exit, only it wasn't clearly signposted which ones these were. In general, all the emergency exits, being just the doors, weren't easily accessible at all. There were just about enough life rafts on board for everyone partying that night, it said there were seven rafts that could support 20 people, and seven life buoys that could support two each. But what's the point in having these on board when no one knows about them? There was no sort of safety briefing of any kind, people just came on board, started drinking, the boat left, and that was it. The crew of two that night was Captain Stephen Faldo and mate Andrew McGowan, as well as two bar staff catering for the party. Faldo and McGowan actually had a business together called Top Bar Enterprises, which people could opt to go with internally for their parties if they didn't want all the faff of looking for an external sort of bar staff company. Captain Faldo was just 29 years old at the time of the sinking, but he'd been working on the Thames since he was just 17 years old, and he'd earned his full Waterman's River licence over five years earlier, becoming the captain of the Marchioness in 1987. A point of sort of contention after the incident was that it was uncovered that Fuldo had forgotten to renew his Riverman's licence that had run out very recently. Technically, on the night of the accident, he wasn't allowed to be on the river. However, the later inquiry said this was a non-issue in terms of the accident. If Captain Faldo survived, which sadly he didn't, he may have got a slap on the wrist, but not having an up-to-date license didn't cause the accident. He was still a very experienced river man with plenty of years of experience. It would have cost him only 50p to renew and then he would have been good to go again. Like, it was really a non-issue. Mate McGowan was 21 years old and he'd completed courses at the Port of London Authority for chart work and seamanship just the year before this, as well as obtaining his apprentice licence in May 1988, which was around the same time that he joined the Marchioness as crew. So both the captain and the mate had plenty of experience. At 1.20am, the early hours of the 20th of August 1989, the Marchioness left her mooring at Charing Cross Pier after a very slight delay, ready for a nice, easy journey down the Thames. This was actually her second journey of that night, having already completed a 7pm to 11pm party, and everything had gone very smoothly as always. Jonathan Pang, the organiser of the party, said that he was nervous at first, but as the boat set sail, he began to relax. People were having fun, the atmosphere was very relaxed, very celebratory. Antonio was a very popular, very charismatic guy with lots of friends from all walks of life. Him and his friends were known for throwing fantastic parties, and this one didn't seem to be any different. However, as the cruise got underway, the potential for incident was already there, lurking behind the scenes. As I said, they hadn't been counting people as they boarded. The disco was right next to the wheelhouse, which meant that Fuldo and McGowan couldn't hear the radio, and therefore they weren't present on the radio for other people. They also didn't have a lookout behind the boat, and they failed to keep to one side of the river. They were just travelling down the middle, which is fine if you're on the radio. The plan that night was to head down the river as far as the Tower of London before heading back to Charing Cross to let off some of the passengers. Then they'd head back down the river again to Greenwich before returning again to Charing Cross for the night to end at 5.45am. It should have been easy, the weather was fine that night, there was a full moon, good visibility, there were no big tides on the river, there shouldn't have been any issues. But as the Marchioness made her way down the river, the bow bell was coming up behind her. The bow bell was a much bigger boat than the tiny Marchioness, it was 262 by 44 feet or 78 by 13.5 metres. She weighed 1,880 tonnes and was an aggregate suction dredger. A quick Google tells me a dredger is a type of boat that is equipped with a tool called a dredge. It draws, sucks, excavates or scrapes sediment like sand, silt, gravel, trash, debris, that kind of stuff from the ocean floor, or in this case the river floor. So the bow bell was dredging things up from the Thames riverbed before it would then be processed through a grading plant on board, meaning there was some pretty serious machinery on the deck of the bow bell. Machinery that actually obscured the forward view from the deck and created a blind spot directly in front of the vessel. 
And then you've also got the fact that the back of the bow bell was also sitting lower in the river than it should have been, meaning that the blind spot was even larger that night than normal. And we're really not talking a tiny blind spot in front of the ship here. They couldn't see in front of them for over 1,000 feet, which is twice as big as what it legally should have been. The Bowbell and her sister ships had been involved in more than 50 incidents of ramming, banging and bumping into other boats, piers and bridges, multiple of which had already been on the Thames. In late 1981, there was literally a collision between Bowbell's sister ship, Bow Trader, and the Marchioness's sister ship, the Hurlingham. The Bowbell that night had a crew of nine people. There was Captain Douglas Henderson, who was 31, two mates, three engineers, two able seamen, and a cook. Two of the crew were stationed at the front of the vessel with their job being lookouts, or at least that's what they said in the early days of the investigation. The facts of this case have changed so much now, all these different people saying different things that we really don't know what the actual story is. But the job of the people stationed at the front was as lookouts, to let the crew know on the bridge if something was ahead of them. However, these people as lookouts had no means of contact apart from just shouting up if they saw something. There had previously been a recommendation that walkie-talkie should be used, but for whatever reason, they had just never been issued. So the Bowbell that night departed from further west down the river, leaving Nine Elms Pier near Battersea Power Station at 1.12am, letting the Thames Navigation Service know through the radio. The Bowbell kept on the radio, reporting their journey down the river, passing Vauxhall Bridge at 1.20am and Waterloo Bridge at 1.35am. The boat was moving average speed down the river, about 5.5 knots, and the Thames Navigation Service was radioing river traffic, advising them of the Bowbell's passage downstream. The crew aboard the Marchioness, though, couldn't hear these radio transmissions, or at least they didn't respond to them, likely due to the disco in the room next door to the wheelhouse. They couldn't hear them. As we know, the Marchioness left Charing Cross Pier at 1.25am and started her journey in the same direction east at about 3.2 knots, the Bowbell slowly catching up. Just before Blackfriars Bridge, the Marchioness passed her sister cruiser, Hurlingham, who was also hosting a party on board, heading in the same direction. Travelling down the centre of the river, Marchioness passed through the central arch of Blackfriars Bridge, now heading directly towards the central arch of Southwark Bridge. The Bowbell was right behind. At about 1.46am, just as the Marchioness passed under the Southwark Bridge, the Bowbell caught up. Now, there is some discussion online as to whether the collision happened before or after this bridge. A number of survivors feel sure it was before, but official reports state it was after. I can only really follow the official reports for this because otherwise I'm just speculating, but I do want to make it known there is a discrepancy there, and some say this is a sign of just how poorly this investigation was conducted, but we'll be talking more about that shortly. In the early investigations, the two seamen on the front of the Bowbell on lookout said they did see the Marchioness first, less than a minute before impact. They would later say they saw the boat about 45 metres off to the side and on a parallel course to the Bowbell. They thought the Bowbell would simply overtake. It would be a close passing, but not unusually so for the Thames. Because they didn't think there was any danger, they didn't shout up to the wheelhouse to warn them. The report of the Chief Inspector of Marine Accidents would later say verbatim. It appears from their evidence that Marchioness then altered to port so as to converge. They attempted to shout a warning which was heard by a few passengers on the deck of the Marchioness, but not in either vessel's wheelhouse, perhaps because of the noise of the disco which was in progress on the boat. No one in Bowbell's wheelhouse saw Marchioness at all before the collision. You see, on this part of the river, there's very slight bend, and the central arches of the Southwark Bridge and the next two bridges downstream aren't quite in alignment, meaning that after going through the central arc of Southwark, ships do need to immediately begin altering course a little to make it easier to line up for the next pass. In the report, it's thought to be this that caused the convergence of the vessels, caused the Marchioness to go into the path of the Bowbell. 
The original collision point was the starboard bow, so the right side of the ship when facing forward of the bow bell colliding with a point towards the stern of the marchioness, the port side, so basically the left if you're facing the front of the ship. This impact caused the marchioness to pivot onto the side, the bow bell's bow smashing through the windows on the port side of the marchioness towards the back of the boat. The second impact was closer to the middle of the marchioness and the pressure of this sort of second impact caused the boat to turn on its side, water rushing in immediately through the broken windows. All of this from the moment of that very first impact happened in just a mere number of seconds. The upper structure of the marchioness, the sort of top floor as it were, was ripped off by Bowbell's anchor, something which was said to have saved quite a few lives. The bow bell essentially steamed right over the top of the tiny marchioness, pushing it directly underwater before it then bobbed back up to the surface very briefly. Within 30 seconds of the original moment of impact, the boat had sunk. 30 seconds which would alter the lives of so many people forever, tragically ending the lives of 51. The marchioness did float on her side long enough for the mate who had been ejected into the water when the sort of top floor had been ripped off to clamber onto the port side and open a door which led into the dance deck, allowing some passengers inside, which was basically the bottom floor, to escape. And then the boat sank. Survivors' accounts of what happened are harrowing. Jonathan Pang, who did survive, said that he became aware of the imminent crash just seconds before it happened. Him and his friend Timothy Blake, who wouldn't survive, were standing at the bar on the top deck when Tim suddenly grabbed Jonathan's hand and said, get over to the side of the boat, pointing out the window to the oncoming bow bell. Jonathan said to the later inquest, the boat started to capsize, all the glass in the windows and the side of the boat burst and water started flooding in. I was up to my waist in water. The next thing I knew, I was just submerged in water and I fell out the window. I don't really know how I got in the water. In those moments before impact, he said he took off his glasses, his mind immediately going into fight mode, knowing that his glasses could shatter and blind him and he needed his sight for what was about to happen. He said there was a sharp crack of wood and the entire floor disappeared beneath their feet. What we now know to be the anchor ripping the top level of the boat. That's probably how he ended up in the water. So whilst the people on the top deck were automatically ejected into the open water, the people in the lower deck were trapped. With the boat on its side slowly filling up with water, it was very hard to navigate to the door, which was the only true exit. Imagine the room you're currently in is suddenly flipped on its side. It's going to take you a second to make sense of where things are. Precious seconds that the victims here couldn't afford to lose. As we know, the mate did manage to climb aboard and open the door to the lower deck, but people down there were already trapped and drowning. All the furniture suddenly flew, like trapping people against the walls, against the windows. A lot of people down there couldn't move, even if they wanted to. Another survivor was Andrew Sutton, who attended the party with his girlfriend and friends. He said that they felt a bit like outsiders that night because he didn't really know Antonio, who obviously was the birthday boy. He'd been dragged along to the party by his friend, Chris Garnham. Because they felt kind of awkward about being there sort of uninvited, the group headed to the foredeck of the boat with another friend, Tony Lomanyem. Because Andrew was at the very front of the boat, he was actually able to escape physical injury. He was simply thrown into the water at the time of impact, holding the hand of his girlfriend, Helen. He said that she was screaming once they got in the water and Andrew tried to swim away. He was sort of trying to drag her along, but there was something trapping his legs. He thought he was caught on something and started to panic, but when he put his head under the water, he saw Tony holding onto his thighs, trying to pull himself up to the surface. Tony was being dragged down, either by the boat or the current, but Andrew said there was nothing he could do without letting go of his girlfriend, who was also getting dragged down. And then Tony was gone and they were alone. He then describes dragging Helen towards the north shore of the river, dragging her heavy woolen coat off her so it didn't weigh her down. He describes trying to get onto boats and barges moored in the river, but everything was covered in slimy algae, not allowing him to have a solid hold. 
they fought for their lives in that water for almost half an hour, eventually finding something buoyant floating in it. He forced Helen's arms onto this sort of like buoyant thing to keep her afloat, but by this point she was unconscious. Andrew said that he was about to give up, about to just let go, when all of a sudden he saw Helen's legs above him as she was being pulled onto a police boat. The next thing he remembers is lying unconscious on the boat as two officers try to resuscitate Helen. Both him and Helen would be taken to the hospital, but Andrew was released very shortly after, saying there were people who simply needed more medical attention than he did. Somehow he was fine. He then got a friend to drive him down to the river to see if he could help, but they ended up in the wrong area. Imagine going through all that in one night. You go to a party, you end up in the water, you watch your friend die because you can't do anything to help, you literally save your girlfriend's life, you then end up in hospital but your medical needs aren't that serious so you're told to go home so then instead you go back to the river to try and help. Like that is incredible that his first thought was I need to do more to try and help the people in that water. Another survivor that night was Annette Russell. She was up on the deck when the collision happened, saying she instinctively dove off the boat at the moment of impact. She went underneath the water and when she came back up, her head was the only one above the water. She said it was completely silent, the marchioness had already half sunk. And then she was pulled back under and was taken by the current through the arches of the bridge. Luckily, Annette was a very strong swimmer and she did manage to reach the bank of the river. She was rushed to hospital in an ambulance, which very soon arrived. And then again, because she was uninjured, she was discharged and taken to the Howard Hotel, which was right on the embankment by the Thames. Police were using it as their information centre for the accident and were questioning survivors there. Annette said she got a call from her father while she was at the hotel, who was desperately trying to find out more information about the accident. Her parents lived in Oxfordshire and police had turned up at their house telling them that Annette was missing and she was presumed dead. Which is just one of many questionable police decisions in the aftermath of this. Annette was taken to hospital, she wasn't dead. Why are police turning up at the houses of parents so soon after the disaster telling them that their kid's dead when there's no actual proof of that? All in all, 51 people died that night, including the birthday boy, Antonio de Vasconcellos. Many of the survivors have been traumatised since this day, still trying to wrap their heads around what happened. Some were so shell-shocked that as soon as they swam their way to the riverbanks, they just climbed out and walked home, not knowing what else to do. Imagine being in a situation like this, when you reach the bank when you're one of the lucky ones to survive. What do you do? Something which did save a lot of lives that night was actually the Marchioness's sister ship, Hurlingham, which as I said earlier was also hosting a party travelling in the same direction, and it was only about 150 to 200 feet away when the disaster happened. The crew and the people aboard the boat saw what happened and they immediately headed to the site of the collision to pull people out of the water, just dragging them in through the windows. Many more people would have died if it weren't for that. The crew actually had to tell the partiers on board who were all rushing to try and help to not rush to one side because they risk capsizing as well. So they had to try and keep people on one side while just a few pulled people through the windows. George Williams, the captain of the Hurlingham, put out a call on the radio immediately to share what had happened to ask people to send emergency aid. However, the Thames Navigation Service misheard the location as Battersea Bridge, not Southwark Bridge, and the Thames Division of the Met only heard part of the call, so they then turned to the Thames Navigation Service for clarification, meaning that all the emergency services headed to the completely wrong part of the river. After the collision, the Bow Bell also hit one of the piers at Cannon Street Bridge, and then they radioed to correct the location. Captain Henderson reported, I have to get underway now and proceed out through bridges. I believe I have struck a pleasure craft. It has sunk. I'm getting clear of the bridges now. I was distracted by flashing lights from another pleasure craft. My vessel was proceeding outward bound just approaching Cannon Street Bridge and, well, I just lost steerage. And, um, I don't know after that. I can't really say anything else. Over. After the collision, the bow bell just travelled away. It didn't stop, it didn't deploy the ship's life buoys or lifeboats or make any effort to rescue survivors. It just continued on its journey. 
in my personal opinion, and is just that, my opinion, that is as much of a crime as what happened in the first place. Like sure, maybe what actually happened, the collision was an accident, but to not stop, to not try and save anyone's lives, that's pretty deplorable. Within half an hour of the collision, a major incident was declared at Scotland Yard and the police's body recovery team was deployed and the first body arrived at Wapping Police Station, where the bodies were held until the mortuary in Westminster was adequately prepared for the influx. The very next day, the wreckage of the Marchioness was located and work was begun on lifting the vessel. 24 bodies were found on board, with 12 of them being in the lower saloon. The remaining 27 bodies were found in the river. The last body actually wasn't found for two weeks. In those early hours of the investigation, the Bowbells Captain Henderson and second mate Kenneth Noble were arrested. Both were breathalysed and it was soon announced that alcohol was not the cause of the collision. Again, it would come out many years later that Henderson had misled the investigators in the early investigation. He'd had his six pints of beer and then only slept for three hours before going to captain the Bowbell that night. The sinking of the Marchioness was national news by the next day, with many parents across the UK with their kids having moved to London, find themselves hoping and praying that their kids hadn't been on board. One of those parents was Margaret Lockwood Croft, who had a 26-year-old son called Sean. She said she saw the sinking on the news and knew that Sean lived pretty nearby, so decided to try and get in contact with him just in case. When he didn't answer the phone, she left him a voicemail, but she said she just had a feeling that something was very wrong. After she doesn't hear back from Sean, Margaret said she decided to head into central London herself to try and find out more and she heads to the information centre. Once there, she has an interview with an officer, they're filling out this form whilst asking her all these questions about how Sean could be identified if he was one of the ones on the boat. And then they get to the last question, what funeral director are you going to use? That was the official way she was told her son was dead. And this would start a 30 plus year battle for the families and survivors of this tragedy, a battle which is still ongoing today. The day after the collision, the coroner for the city of Westminster opened the inquest and then adjourned it on the same day. The job of identifying the dead had to begin and it wasn't going to be an easy process. The first time I actually heard about this disaster was in the book Unnatural Causes by Dr Richard Shepherd, who is one of Britain's top forensic psychologists. He was involved in the aftermath of the Marchioness, he was involved in many of the identifications made, and I feel like instead of using my own words here when sort of talking about the identifications, I'll do a much better job if I just read a passage from this book. People find it hard to believe that in mass disasters, visual identification is unreliable, especially so when death has been traumatic or the body has been immersed in water. But even the uninjured and undecomposed dead are often simply not recognisable to those who knew them as animated individuals. Without life, facial expressions, movement, robbed of our essential selves, our bodies can look very different. And this is certainly the case when the dead has been held by the Thames for hours or days. The fact is that relatives, even immediate family, when they're under great stress, are very likely to make mistakes. They may identify a body that isn't their relative, or they may not correctly identify a body that is their loved one. These are known as false positive or false negative identifications, and they happen much more often than you might think. Later, perhaps much later, the identifying relatives sometimes worry they are wrong, and then change their minds. This can occur long after burial or cremation, when our ability to review the identification is lost. Add to the difficulties of identification the immense emotional trauma of having to look at many, many bodies in the mortuary to find the one you think may be your relative. With all my experience of death and dying, I know I could walk between rows of victims and reliably identify my own wife or child or parent. I should say that being called on to see a body for identification purposes is quite different from seeing that body once police and pathologists are sure that the correct identification has taken place. I personally believe every relative who wishes to do so has an absolute right to see the body of their deceased. It is cruel to deny, for whatever reason, a family this chance to say goodbye personally. But the reality is that a lot of bodies may be injured, decomposed and smelly. 
We can do a lot with reconstruction, but we can't perform miracles. He then goes on to say how identification through clothing, jewellery or wallets can be equally unreliable. They can only be treated as clues because people often swap jewellery or look after their friend's wallet. To rely on clothing, they would need an exact account of what a person was wearing. Whereas nowadays we have smartphones, you'd probably take a few selfies before a night out and upload it to Instagram. There was no such thing in 1989. So instead they would turn to the only reliable things, dental records and fingerprints. Officers in this case would dispatch to the homes of victims to recover items that might have prints on them to match to the dead in the mortuary. And to read another passage from the book. Our problem was that these were drowned bodies. They were likely to be damaged either by aquatic predators or by contact with rocks, bridges, boats or other underwater obstructions. Drowned bodies show all the discoloration and bloating of normal decomposition, plus some much earlier skin changes. Even if retrieved from the water within a few hours, those inevitable washerwoman hands can make fingerprinting difficult. And when there is a complete loss of the skin from the hands, well then it can be extremely difficult, almost impossible, to take fingerprints from the deeper layer of the skin, the dermis. As time went on, bodies arrived in worse and worse condition and decomposition became our nemesis. Each body coming in travelled through a system. First, we described in detail clothes, jewellery and general appearance. I then helped remove the clothes and performed an external examination, describing tattoos, scars and anything unusual that might help assist identification. Police officers made notes and the body was photographed and refrigerated. The second phase was then the full post-mortem, after which the internal organs would be, as usual, replaced in the body cavity and the body sewn up and made presentable for viewing by relatives. And this is where, to this day, one of the biggest controversies in the aftermath of the Marchioness happened, something which upset families to their very cause. The victims had their hands removed. Shepard writes in his book that time was of the essence in fingerprinting the bodies coming into the mortuary. With the bodies being submerged in the Thames for extended periods of time, waterlogged skin was sloughing off the fingers and they were having trouble getting prints. As the hours passed, conventional fingerprinting methods were failing, so they had to use specialist techniques and more sophisticated equipment. Equipment that was held at a lab in Southwark that had no facilities to hold bodies. The routine process was apparently for the hands to be removed, sent to the lab in Southwark to be fingerprinted, and then the hands were returned and sewn back onto the bodies to avoid distressing the relatives. So that's what they did here. 25 bodies eventually had their hands removed and sent to Southwark for fingerprinting. This was standard practice at the time, but I don't know if that makes it right or not. The terrible thing is here that many of these bodies never had their hands returned for reasons that still don't seem entirely clear. I just know that in one case, four years after the disaster, severed hands were found in a plastic bin bag inside a mortuary freezer. As all of this is going on, relatives are desperately trying to view the bodies of their loved ones. However, they're being dissuaded at every opportunity. Again, it's not entirely clear why. You could assume that it's because of the state of the bodies, bloated, waterlogged, unrecognisable bodies that their mothers likely wouldn't even recognise. Maybe authorities were trying to save families from the trauma. Maybe that's just looking at things with rose-tinted glasses. But I think sometimes you just need to see things with your own eyes to believe it, to have some form of closure, otherwise you're always wondering. These families wanted to see their loved ones no matter what state they were in. What most people think is that the authorities were concerned that identities had been mistaken and they were worried about families realising. The information about the hands being removed wasn't shared at the time of the disaster. This wouldn't come out for many, many years. And with that, many families then started to believe that that was the reason they'd been denied access to their loved one's bodies, because they'd realised they didn't have their hands. People were furious, and understandably so. The news about the hands actually became public when a funeral director told the family of 20-year-old model Simon Senior that his hands had been missing. Simon's mum Judy has spoken out a lot over the years about her treatment and the treatment of the rest of the families in the aftermath of this, and she said that the news that Simon didn't have his hands when they buried him was devastating to her. 
Judy said that Simon didn't need to have his hands cut off for identification. He had his wallet, credit cards, ID, bank details and car keys on him. They had enough to identify him. In life, Simon was an artist and a bass player. His hands meant everything to him. They were his gateway to his art. His hands being cut off was an indignity. I wish I could tell you that that was the only failure in the aftermath of this, but in all honesty, so much about the Marchioness was badly handled. And as always, when it comes to Britain, the press were absolutely brutal. There is no greater scourge on this country than the tabloid press, something which was true in 1989 and remains true to this very day. I mean, the Evening Standard wrote one particularly horrible headline about how there's now a few less cowboy boots on the King's Road, very thinly veiled homophobia. Apparently it was now a good thing that people had died on the Marchioness. This was obviously 1989, towards the tail end, kind of, of the AIDS crisis, and homophobia was incredibly rife within the media. Although it seems like it wasn't necessarily openly spoken about at the time because A, it wasn't relevant, and B, it just wasn't something that was spoken about, a high number of the passengers aboard the Marchioness were indeed gay. And once some of the more sort of gutter media picked up on this fact, the headlines reflected it, the attitudes changed. No longer was the Marchioness this awful thing that happened, now the event was that the event had simply befallen people who'd bought it on themselves. Young people who were flying too close to the sun, daring to party and have fun on a Saturday night. Youths full of cocaine who were partying too hard. Of course they were going to die, what did they expect? Although this next bit is unsubstantiated, so do take it with a pinch of salt, there are even rumours that rescue workers were told to be careful because many people on board the boat probably had AIDS. Reports say that a bulletin was sent out to the emergency services saying, Based on information from a known and reliable source connected with the pleasure boat industry, the Marchioness was carrying a party of 120 homosexuals and lesbians. Consequently, there is a high risk of AIDS contamination for all officers and emergency services. If this is true, if this is genuinely something that was sent out, which people do deny, you've got to ask yourself, how much did this affect the rescue efforts? Families have said that even the authorities, officers, seemed less than sympathetic when dealing with them. Could this be why? Why did families feel like they were in the wrong for just trying to find their children? Jonathan Pang would later say that he was told on one occasion that they hoped he'd enjoyed his 15 minutes of fame following this. 51 of his friends had died and he's being told, enjoy the fame. You're probably wondering if there was any sort of justice for the survivors and the families, but you won't be shocked to find out that there really wasn't. In October 1989, the companies behind Bobel and Marchioness agreed to pay £6 million in compensation to the families of the victims. And that's not £6 million each, obviously, that's between everyone. But neither company ever admitted any liability. Just one week later, it was recommended by the Director of Public Prosecutions that no criminal charges should be brought against Henderson, but that was just a recommendation. The deal with Inquest was very confusing in the aftermath of this, so the Inquest was meant to be a two-parter, the first part dealing with the causes of death, and the second part establishing the responsibility of the crash and then making safety recommendations. However, the whole deal around whether or not criminal charges were actually going to be made against Henderson was very much still up in the air, so the full inquest couldn't even take place, lest it prejudiced any future trial. So the inquest instead was just sort of a series of mini inquests looking into the causes of death for each of the 51 bodies. Obviously, most died from drowning. But then, on the 26th of April 1990, the Director of Public Prosecution stepped in to stop this inquest because they'd finally decided that charges were going to be brought against Henderson. And he was charged under the Merchant Shipping Act of 1988 for failing to have an effective lookout on his ship. The case against him opened on the 4th of April 1991 at the Old Bailey and ran for 10 days. In the end, the jury failed to reach a decision, so a retrial was to be held, which happened in the second half of July. Again, in the second trial, the jury also failed to come to a decision, so Henderson was acquitted. 
And still, there was no public inquiry into the disaster. However, the government did decide to publish the Marine Accident Investigation Branch's report on what had happened. And this was hugely criticised by the families and survivors because they hadn't interviewed a single person aboard the boat. They relied solely on police interviews. It just wasn't good enough. It wasn't justice for anyone and provided no resolution. How can they know what had happened if they didn't talk to anyone who went through it? Six years on, in spring 1995, the resumed inquest took place and a jury did return with a verdict of unlawful killing. Unlawful killing. And surely that suggests that someone was responsible. But still, no charges came on the back of this. Nobody knew who to point the finger at. Those affected by the disaster could apply for compensation from the government, but it wasn't an easy process and for many it was more stress than it was worth. English law actually provides no compensation for fatal accidents other than for funeral expenses, so most families receive nothing. Eventually, many of the families did bring forward civil claims for compensation, and the amounts they received varied anywhere from £3,000 to £190,000, but after having to pay for lawyers, bills, funerals, they were left with pennies. Apparently, they were awarded more sort of like modest amounts because the victims were young, they had no dependents, no established careers, the damages were based on economic loss to the victim, and young people are just worth less. It's absolutely brutal. You mean less to the government because you don't have kids, because you haven't established who you are yet, because you're figuring your life out. And therefore, you are worth less than somebody in their 40s who has two kids. Like, I can understand that on a base economic level for sure, but does economy come over humanity? There's no silver lining in this horrible case. There was finally a formal inquiry done in 2000, which was 11 years after the collision. It concluded that the basic cause of the collision was very clear, poor lookouts on both vessels, neither saw the other in time to avoid it, but it was still unlawful. Lord Justice Clark, who was chairing the inquiry, criticised Captain Henderson, saying that he should have broadcast a Mayday alert and he should have deployed both the lifeboat on the Bowbell and her life raft. He made 30 recommendations to improve river safety, including far stricter alcohol regulations, because as you may remember, Captain Henderson had had six beers. A few things were put into action after this inquiry to save people were something like this to happen again. There were chains put on the riverbank for people to grab onto in case of disaster. There were four new lifeboat stations placed up the river as of the early 2000s, which have undeniably saved numerous lives since. To be exact, there were 43 new laws put into action. More effective radio communication, CCTV up and down the river, vessels now having to have illuminated bows and brightly lit orange panels on their stern. A criminal act of corporate manslaughter was put into action in 2007. These things have undoubtedly saved lives, but it's not justice for the families or the survivors. The authorities have refused to put the responsibility on anyone or any company but still something went wrong here. And that is still where we are today. There's still no justice, just awful treatment. I wish I could tell you that our government came through for the survivors, but they just didn't. From the outset, the treatment of the victims in this case were poor. It doesn't seem like they ever really had any chance. At its most basic, the cause of the collision here was the Bowbell and Marchioness on the same course. They went on the same course, they collided, that was that. But there has to be something more here. How was that allowed to happen? How did nobody see it happening? And I think that is where the families here and the survivors really want their answers. How was this allowed to happen in 1989 in central London? Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I know this has been a bit of a depressing episode, but history, sadly, a lot of the time just is very depressing. There's not always a silver lining. Again, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.